Hello, I'm Gavin Gimanoni. I'm a neurologist based in London, and welcome to this podcast. We're going to be talking about the urgency to change MS care. So we've chosen the urgency of change in MS care because we'd like to uh, highlight certain innovation changes, in particular in relation to the innovation challenge, where we think uh, a changing medical practice is required to optimize the uh, management and the outcomes of people with multiple sclerosis. So I've been joined by a panel of three speakers today, so I'd like to welcome them all. So we'll start off with Leora, you would like to introduce yourself? Absolutely. It's a pleasure to be with you, uh, Gavin. Uh, I'm Leora Freeman. I'm a neurologist and neuroimmunologist at the University of Texas at Austin. Uh, there I direct the MS and Neuroimmunology Center, and I'm also involved in uh, research and education uh, of our next generation of medical uh, doctors specialized in MS. Casey, would you like to introduce yourself? Yes, thank you. I'm Casey Minnis. I'm the executive director of the Multiple Sclerosis Foundation. We are a nonprofit organization that uh, provides direct patient services to people with MS throughout the United States and Puerto Rico. And Amy? Yes, thank you, Gavin, uh, for the invitation. I'm Amy Perrin Ross. I'm an advanced practice nurse in the Chicago land area, and I've been working with people with multiple sclerosis since the late 1980s. I'm also heavily involved with the uh, Consortium of Multiple Sclerosis Centers, and like Leora, I'm working towards training our future generation by being actively involved with the International Organization of MS Nurses. Thank you. So I'd like to start off with Casey. So Casey, could you give me your drive, you know, and your commitment to innovation and making a difference to people with multiple sclerosis? What's your take on this theme? Unlike our other esteemed panelists, where your role is to help individuals with the physical aspects of MS, uh, my role is to help them with the social aspects of MS, the ways in which MS is really affecting their lives. And so often, um, on a daily basis, we hear from individuals who are struggling just to survive. The, the rate of joblessness in MS is very high. The, the rate of financial difficulties, so many struggles that people are going through just to overcome the challenges that MS has given them. And I know with innovation, with further growth in uh, treatment for multiple sclerosis that we'll see less and less of this struggle. Over the 30 years that I've been with the organization, I already see a huge difference. Um, when I started in 1993, uh, it was just around the time of the introduction of the first MS treatment. And to see where we are today, uh, with people being able to work longer, function longer, enjoy their lives more. It's really amazing. The progress has been tremendous. And while we're on that wave of progress, we just want to keep that rolling forward, keep pushing that forward. Okay, so I'm going to define your role in this podcast as the the social health aspect. Amy, what's your, your take on this uh, challenge? What drives me... Uh, Gavin is innovation in and of itself. Um, as I mentioned, I started in MS in the late 1980s. So like Casey, right before the onset of disease-modifying therapies. And I remember back then that mostly all we could do was help people manage symptoms. And even back then, we weren't terribly good. Uh, we were also very, very focused on uh, relapses and what we could do about relapses once they happened, because we had no idea about the concept of preventing relapses back then. Then along comes the, the disease-modifying therapies, and no longer were we really focused on making the most of a bad situation. What we were focused on is looking beyond treating relapses towards the concept of preventing relapses, towards true disease management. And obviously, we've come a, a great long way since, you know, the, the early 1990s with the early disease-modifying therapies. 
so what really drives me in this is the concept of hope, um, because I think the further we go into our innovation journey with MS, the greater our opportunities to offer true hope to people and their families living with multiple sclerosis. Thank you. So, Leora, to you now, being a clinician and a researcher in, in, in immunology, thinking beyond the DMTs, you know, what is your take on innovation in the last, say, 20 years in the field? Yeah, no, I, I think what's been really interesting, I've been an MS specialist now for over 15 years, and uh, even, you know, I've not been around as long as Amy, but I've seen so many changes in the way that we practice, and, and I also feel that we're really at kind of the cusp of, you know, just just something really great in the care of people with MS. What really drives me uh, in my in my practice and my, my profession is to go beyond treating the disease and truly helping people thrive. Uh, I've seen it time and again that sometimes diagnosis of MS can be uh, life-changing, but in a positive way that people can thrive with this diagnosis if they have the right support and if they have the right management. And, uh, you know, as you say, in my role as a clinician, as a researcher, as an educator, I can see how innovation can span all of these pillars, these aspects. You know, we can uh, better educate, uh, make education more accessible through innovation for uh, our clinicians, but also for patients. Uh, we can develop novel models of care that address the needs of patients in a more holistic and comprehensive way. And that is also innovation. Then we can, you know, identify new technologies uh, that can help us in uh, identifying needs of patients in addressing those needs in, in a better way. I feel that we've gone a long ways with our disease modifying therapy, but in many ways we still practice MS care the same way that we did. We look at MRIs the same way. We look at, you know, um, just overall management in, in a similar way than we did 15 years ago. And I think that now with novel innovation, technology, uh, just overall a more transformative uh, thinking uh, about MS care, we, we should be able to achieve not just, you know, controlling the disease, controlling relapses, but truly helping people achieve greater brain health. Yeah, so that's actually something that uh, I think the MS community is waking up to, is that MS is not just MS, but we have to think about you know managing comorbidities or preventing comorbidities and how we improve all aspects. Now, I want to come back to Casey. Casey, one of the issues I have in the space, we have a very motivated, very literate, very activated group of people with a disease. And then on the other side of the spectrum, we have these disconnected people, the people who feel left behind or are left behind. What do you think we could do from an innovation technology perspective to bring everybody up to the same standard? Because that's one of my concerns is that we are creating all these new tools and these new things, but we are leaving a group of people behind and it's creating quite a lot of inequality in the, in the care we deliver. I think, you know, at, at least speaking from my experience in the United States, part of the problem is about access to care. Only about half of people with MS are treated by an MS specialist only about half have access to someone with that specialized training and knowledge. They're being treated by general neurologists who may not be as up to date on the innovations that have been made in MS care. So I think that part of this process is when we do have these innovations, that we need organizations to be doing a real push to educate the healthcare providers as well as the patients. In my experience, the vast majority of patients, they want to be actively involved in their care. When we do educational sessions on things patients can do themselves, diet, exercise, mental health, those are usually our best attended program. The, the people with MS want to be able to better their lives and to take an active part in their care, but unfortunately, not all of them are being given that opportunity. Yeah, so Amy, what innovation could you bring to the table to upskill or you know, at least get the general neurologist, not the specialist MS healthcare professional uh, up to speed with what's happening? Gavin, I think to build on Casey's points, I think one of the things that we need to really do is reach out to colleagues around us and uh, general neurology practices, general neurology nursing, 
And many situations, uh, groups like corn care nurses and infusion nurses who are seeing these patients on a regular basis, either for treatment or home management or whatever, and letting them know about organizations like the Multiple Sclerosis Foundation, which provide resources not only for our patient and their families, but to healthcare providers as well. And I encourage, you know, the the nursing community that I educate to take a look at these organizations like the Multiple Sclerosis Foundation or the Multiple Sclerosis Association of America. They have wonderful resources. And I think sometimes if the patients and their families can be made aware of these things in settings that are a little less stressful than the physician's office, they're sometimes a little bit better able to hear or much more ready to to hear and to understand, hey, there are lots of resources out there besides just my physician or clinician. Yeah, so one of the things that I know that the European Charcoal Foundation and possibly Ectrims are trying to do is a certification scheme. You know, they mean make MSA a subspecialty where people have to be certified. Uh, do you think this would work? Do you think other neurologists, other healthcare professionals would take up a additional training uh, to get themselves certified in a subspecialty? I think we really need to think beyond just training. I think what we need is building community. Um, you know, when we think about certification, sometimes people just just do the certification but don't remain engaged. What we really need is having novel models for engagement with our community uh, clinicians, with our community at large. And really a question, and this is also how, you know, novel technology, novel models of engagement can help us really reach those that we don't really know are seeing people with MS or, or those that are affected by MS uh, that are in uh, communities that we are not typically seen at you know, MS centers. Uh, so I really think we need to think, you know, just just you know, beyond just training, but really engaging. And, and that's a different framework. So any of you give me examples where this is working, you know, this uh, alternative or a technology-driven engagement program? I can, Gavin, and it's a group called the Multiple Sclerosis Nursing Pro, which is a group that I have been a part of since its inception. And basically what it is, is a, a group that is supported by the European Multiple Sclerosis Platform. And what we have done over the years as a group of international nurses physicians and other healthcare providers is to develop a curriculum. And we have seven modules, everything from pathophysiology of the disease to symptom management to rehabilitation and now research. These modules are available to any nurse uh, who goes on to the MS Pro platform and signs up. To Leora's point, there are now many interactive videos and interactive scenarios that the nurses can click on, and they can complete each module individually and then test out at the end. They don't really have a true certification, but there is a certificate of completion, and the uptake over the years based on the interest of healthcare providers particularly in Europe, has been absolutely tremendous. In North America, many of us require certifications for our job or to advance in our own roles. That's not the case everywhere in the world. And so the fact that MS Nurse Pro is reaching and continues to reach out to so many nurses across Europe is a, is a wonderful thing. I think it speaks to their desire to have more access for information. I can give another example, Gavin, that we're currently building with the MS Association of America, which is the MS Implementation Network, uh, which is gonna function as a connected network of MS 
uh, centers, uh, including, you know, uh, people who CMS who are general neurologists, people who practice in rural or underserved areas. And uh, at the basis of this MS implementation network is kind of a data collection platform, effectively making it a learning health system uh, where clinicians who see people with MS are going to learn in real time about their patients, about their practice model. And through uh, implementation science, we are going to identify innovations that matter uh, for people with MS and help implement them across different systems, not just academic centers who have resources, but also underserved centers, federally qualified health centers and others to be able to make innovation accessible to all with MS. That's good. Now, Casey, from a, a person with a disease perspective, are there any courses you can you think of where people can upskill themselves for the newly diagnosed patient, for example? I'm aware of one in Australia, run out of Tasmania and Hobart, Hobart, Tasmania, where you could actually register an online course to teach yourself about the disease. But are you aware of any other ones that people can subscribe to? The patient-facing MS organizations. Um, like my organization, the Multiple Sclerosis Foundation, but also the National MS Society, uh, the MSAA, Can Do MS. Um, these organizations have ongoing educational programs for people with MS to learn to live with and manage their disease. Getting connected with one of these organizations, obviously biased toward ours, but um, with any of the organizations is a great first step for newly diagnosed people. There are peer mentoring programs, there are exercise and wellness programs. There are so many things out there for people with MS to be able to learn how to best live with this condition. Yeah, so just to say that in the UK, not in the MS space, but in the type 1 diabetes space, there's an incredible course where everybody who's recently diagnosed with diabetes actually has to do it as part of their management. It's, it's, a, sta it's a national standard now. And the uh, outcome in terms of the management of the disease has just been transformed by the... By the uh, and it's actually a group course. People go on together and learn about the disease, how to self-manage and, and how to manage it. So I think Obviously, MS is a little bit more complicated than type 1 diabetes. But I do think that if we put our heads together, we could almost certainly come up with something innovative in the MS space that could be international. It doesn't have to be national. Well, and the wonderful thing is post-pandemic, most of these educational offerings are available virtually as well as in person. And I know speaking for, for us, for our health and wellness programs, uh, we have individuals from all over the world join the programs. And it's really wonderful to see the MS community coming together across oceans to share information and to support one another and to, to get these learnings. So I think that's enough to cover the introduction in, uh, of the first part of this podcast on the urgency of change in uh, MS case. So I'd just like to thank uh, Casey, Amy, and Leora for participating. And uh, I hope the listeners will, you know, sign into the second part. Thank you. Mm -hmm.